WMAL, where Washington comes to talk. Joining us on the line now is uh, Michael Waltz. Uh, he's done some time in Washington, knows his way around town, but we wanted to talk to him because he was an Army major commanding U.S. Special Forces in eastern Afghanistan at the time that Bo Bergdahl disappeared. He's got a lot of first-hand knowledge about it, and we want to sort of tap into what he knew and what he believes about this particular case. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. All right. So uh, some have said he was a deserter. Some have said he walked away. Based on your time and your knowledge on the ground there in, in, in that time frame, what is it that you believe, and why do you believe it? Our understanding at the time, and, and as you mentioned, I commanded a number of special forces teams along the Afghan Pakistani border uh, in 2009. Our understanding at the time was that he had walked off his base. He did not have his weapon. He did not have his helmet or his body armor. And that he had voluntarily left and, and walked into the local town and into the hands of the Taliban. And I have to tell you, uh, you know, it's one thing to put your life on the line to rescue a hostage or to rescue a POW, uh, but it didn't so- sit well with many of us to uh, risk our lives. And in, and in a number of cases, our comrades lost their lives uh, to go after a guy that had, that had simply handed himself over. All right, so many questions, but 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 uh, first and foremost, uh, lost their lives. You you know of cases where uh, military officials, law, I mean soldiers, lost their lives in the search for Bo Bergdahl. Absolutely. Listen, every single unit uh, stopped what they were doing. We were ordered to stop what we were doing, whether it was reconstruction projects. Uh, helping local villagers or or hunting down Taliban commanders. We all stopped. We all shifted uh, for at least the next month and searched for Sergeant Bergdahl. The conventional Army units set up uh, checkpoints uh, to the extent they could, often for days on end, uh, out trying to stop uh, him from being taken over the border while many of the special operations units swept through villages and homes and after locations where they thought they were being held. And, uh, and men died on those operations, and they were directly um, attributed to, and they were directly geared towards trying to find them. Uh, our guest is Michael Waltz. He's got a brand-new book coming out this fall, by the way, called Warrior Diplomat, A Green Beret's Battles from Washington to Afghanistan. And I wonder what can be more treacherous sometimes for you, Michael Waltz. And, and I want to ask about the politics of this, because we are suddenly now being lectured to by pundits and supporters of the president of the De- Democratic Party saying that we shouldn't be playing politics with this story, that uh, no man should be left behind, and it uh, doesn't matter, he's a he's an American war veteran, and we, we deserve to bring him back. And, and, and obviously that's... That sentiment is nice, but uh, at what cost? We have to look at these five Taliban, uh, high-level Taliban members, these terrorists that we've been holding since Gitmo, uh, excuse me, since 9-11 at Gitmo. We've released them now, and there could be an enormous cost paid and additional American lives lost for the sake of getting Bo Bergdahl back. Was this a wise thing to do? Well, I think think you're absolutely right. And so there's two aspects to this. Listen, no one that I know of uh, is debating whether we bring an American home and we do whatever's possible uh, and whatever we can to bring him home, regardless of the circumstances. So I think that's a little bit of a specious argument. Uh, no one has issue there. What we have issue with is the, is the price that we paid um, and how it was handled. I think that you would have seen a very different reaction uh, from the veterans community if you know, a, a statement was released. There was a quiet reunion with his family away from the eyes of the media. And and the community uh, was assured that the Defense Department would get to the bottom of what happened. Can I follow I up on that? That would have been very different than than going on national television and saying he served as, as was a hero and served with honor and distinction. Yeah, th- these words matter, and I just want to follow up on that for a second because there has been an uh, avalanche of soldiers coming out now and talking to the media saying, hey, you're getting this guy wrong. The combination of Susan Rice saying he served with honor and distinction and the president doing that Rose Garden uh, press conference with his parents on either side. Th- can you say, uh, considering the fact that you were there and you served with these men, at the time, can you say definitively that, that those two actions really rubbed the, the, the soldiers the wrong way here? Well, it certainly rubbed me the wrong way, and I, and I received my own avalanche of, uh, of phone calls from both my men that were on the ground and, and others that we knew who were, who were extremely concerned that, you know, there would kind of be a quote-unquote ticker tape parade and, and, uh, 
and, and a lot of high fives around Washington and that the truth wouldn't come out that this would be swept under the rug. And I think that's, uh, I'm confident that that's why you're seeing this, this avalanche of folks coming out because they were determined that the truth uh, be known. Uh, there, there, there's a Time Magazine story out today that says that there's an interagency process when it comes to the release of detainees out of uh, Guantanamo Bay. And he says that the Pentagon and the intelligence community was dead set against the release of these guys. As a guy who's been on the ground, do you have concerns about the fact that these guys who've been released, these really bad guys, these high-value detainees who were traded for Bergdahl, will end up in the, in the field of combat again? Well, listen, I, I also served as a, as a civilian in the White House under the Bush administration, so I'm familiar with the process. And, uh, and it's an extensive process. These, uh, these individuals literally are the, the Taliban war cabinet. So, look, you can't have it both ways. You can't argue for over a decade that these gentlemen needed to be held in Guantanamo. They couldn't be tried in the United States, and they couldn't be released because they were just that dangerous. But now turn around when, you know, when it's convenient, frankly, and kind of shrug our shoulders and say it won't be that bad. Um, so, yes, absolutely, I think uh, these guys will have a difference, and if you will make a difference in the region. And, you know, the other calls I've been getting are from Afghans and Afghan Americans who are just stunned. Said, you know, in the same week, we've announced that we're going to the zero option in terms of a complete withdrawal from Afghanistan. And, you know, uh, and the timing of that will be when these guys are, are finished with their travel ban and in Qatar. And don't forget, the Afghans are going to the polls in two weeks to uh, elect a new president. So they're just uh, flabbergasted, frankly. Our guest is Michael Waltz. He commanded a U.S. Army Special Forces unit there in Afghanistan at the time of Bergdahl's disappearance. And I, I, I want to I want to narrow this down here and ask you definitively, because of all the things that you've told us, I, I, I think that it's. I think this question is legitimate, if, if possible. Do do you and your fellow soldiers, when you talk about this, based on what happened this weekend, do you feel betrayed? Well, we feel we feel that it could have been handled uh, much more respectfully for the men who uh, men who did not get a tearful reunion with their families this weekend, and and I think that's what really rubbed folks. Uh, the wrong way. There was no mention of the families of the fallen uh, over the weekend and, and in the ceremonies, and, and, and they, at a minimum, want apology and, and want justice here. They want an apology from whom? They want, they want an apology from uh, Sergeant Bergdahl, uh, most specifically. Great. All right. Thank you for that. Well, it's... listen, and thank you for your service, and thanks for being willing to talk to us about what uh, what you know uh, from that, that time and place, because it is certainly something that everybody's talking about right now. Well, absolutely. And and again, this isn't this isn't about me or, or those who made it back. This is about the the, the men who did. All right. Once again, Michael Waltz. By the way, our uh, board op, Mike McKay, a Vietnam vet from the Army, he stood and saluted you there, Green Beret. So uh, you got that going for you. Michael Waltz. Hey, thanks, guys. Have a great morning. Thank you. His book coming up this fall, Warrior Diplomat, a Green Beret's Battles from Washington to Afghanistan.